Yes. Uh, welcome, uh, respected Raghuram ji. Uh, we are uh, now eager to listen to your second session. Thank you so much for joining us. Namaskar. Namaste. Thank you. In fact, in the area of yoga and psychology, the amount of contribution that Indian philosophy has done, I don't think anywhere else in the world, they have thought about that depth. And I would like to share today the unique aspect of what about this psychology from the Indian point of view perspective, how we can take it. There may be several things that are there, the Upanishads and various other Puranas contribute a lot towards the psychological aspect of us. But I would like to focus myself on Bhagavad Gita and the way that how Bhagavad Gita has helped us to understand the deeper aspects of psychology. I would like to share with that. So let me just go back directly by sharing my... <clears throat> Bhagavad Gita is a very important text of philosophy, but at the same time, it's a psychology. Why I have chosen Bhagavad Gita is that uh, it's a text of yoga, but at the same time, it's a text of deep philosophy. But very important thing is, it has been presented at the time when Arjuna was in total uh, confusion in the battlefield at a mental level. So therefore, that it addresses the psychology. Now, wars have taken place. War will always be taking place. You don't even remember about these wars. But then this particular war of Mahabharata is extraordinary because of it has this Bhagavad Gita. Nowhere else in the war field that you could have a text like this can emerge out of it. And that's what is the beauty of Bhagavad Gita, that it is in the war field. The representation is that war is supposed to be the most critical situation in human being's life. So if I have to take an example of human being's mental psychology, mental, mental aspect of it. The most difficult situation that I could think of is the war field. And particularly, you are the warrior in between. You are the chief of the warrior. And then get into this problem. And that is supposed to be something. If in the war that some could, some, somebody could address your psychology, that means to say the normal day-to-day -day life, we can definitely address that. So that is the reason why this particular Bhagavad Gita becomes a very important text. The second important aspect of Bhagavad Gita, why it is supposed to be something which is meant with higher psychology is that, you know, the simple thing is that when, see, people who know about Bhagavad Gita, the context of it, you know that it is very clearly the war between people who are righteous and who are not righteous. <coughs> Arjuna was on the side of Dharma, Duryodhana was on the side of Adharma. <coughs> Arjuna had a problem, Duryodhana did not have any problem. So, and Arjuna had to be given Bhagavad Gita. And uh, you know that <coughs> sorry, if look at the case of Arjuna, were good, and then he suffered all the kind of sufferings in the hands of Pandava Kauravas. And then I come to the battlefield. And at that time, he became nervous and he does not want to fight the war. If that was the only issue and Krishna is supposed to motivate him to fight the war, it would not have been difficult because Arjuna is a Kshatriya, is a warrior. So you can always emotionally stir him and to see that he can perform the war. Many times we see that emotionally people get easily excited about that. Krishna could have said to Arjuna, look at what all happened to your brothers, your wife and this and that. All un <clears throat> unknown kind of sufferings that you had to go through because of the evil framework of Duryodhana and therefore that you should take a revenge and then go ahead and fight the war. If you could have easily evoked him from his emotions, 
and then he could have made him to fight the war if war fighting the war was only the purpose of it but that was not the war if if only that kind of a thing then krishna should not have had wasted 700 shlokas on bhagavad gita one more chapter another 10 shlokas should have been good enough to excite arjuna to go and fight the war but at that point of time it is arjuna who is not fighting the war but it is the anger which is a which is the forces that are there negative in arjuna which is going to fight the war but krishna's purpose was not like that make use of this situation to see that the wisdom of arjuna is the one that comes up and then finally he fights the war so therefore this is a very unique situation where the whole approach has been to see that raise the consciousness of arjuna to a different level so it is not just to make him emotionally stirred agitated and then give this so if that was there then only the argument would have been the right and wrong good and bad this is bad it is good to fight them it is good to eliminate them this is the only thing normally that any spiritual text that you think of only thinking of pairs of opposite that's what is the right and wrong good and bad and the discussion that is there in battlefield indicating the knowledge of and addressing the life problem and that's why it is and then now you see people have this suffering everyone's life has suffering vishada only arjuna could turn, turn the vishada into yoga that's why the first chapter is actually vishada yoga now when you look at all these things that you see that you can always use the suffering to see that you can spiritually grow to a higher level that's what the message has given now this message of spirituality which bhagavad gita gives is something which is much different from the other spiritual texts because the simple reason is that all the other texts whether you take bible or anything like that it is all about the pairs of opposite do right and don't do wrong that is the kind of thing it's more or less the whole approach has been one of the moralistic principles that are given or the idea that are given is that don't do bad do good this is what is the way that you do all the 10 commandments also like that don't tell lies don't do negative kind of things that's what is the message that he gives quran also gives the same way a talmud any other spiritual text but bhagavad gita is not a text which talks about good and bad right and wrong because arjuna has always been very good and not only that he is very honest and he is always respecting his elders and he was there is no way that you could take arjuna, you could tell arjuna that be good be right so that you can uh, you don't have any psychological problems that's not the issue because arjuna was good so there must be some if the bhagavad gita was supposed to be krishna talking to duryodhana who was supposed to be evil and he did all kinds of negative designs about that he did not have any respect for his elders with all those things that arjuna was suffering but duryodhana was very happy peaceful and he was fighting the war with all enthusiasm so that means to say that this problem that bhagavad gita talks about psychological problem is not for the bad it is for the good so therefore that if bad was suffering because of psychology some issues and all those things then you don't have to give him bhagavad gita you tell him to be good like somebody comes to me and says that he complained that because he was telling lies now people don't believe that he is in trouble they said don't tell lies stop telling lies tell the truth so it's a very simple moralistic education that is there altruistic approach that is what is necessary same thing if i am hurting somebody then i say don't hurt anybody so that you will be free from that people will not hurt you so that's a simple message that we could give but that is not the message that arjuna because the bhagavad gita is addressed by krishna to duryodhana it then that, that was a different issue but here gita was addressed to arjuna who is supposed to be good all the way good and consciously he was good respecting the elders and all those things so that means to say the message in bhagavad gita is not about the good and bad right and wrong it is something which is beyond that message of good and bad this is something which is very interesting because you can always think of a text which can talk about good and bad right and wrong and all that you can't think of any knowledge which is beyond the pairs of opposite and that's a whole area that bhagavad gita discusses 
that's why I always say that where all the other religion texts stop, Bhagavad Gita starts. Because Gita is addressed to not for the bad. Therefore, it's a very simple thing is, one message that we get out of it is that just being good is not good enough, is, will not guarantee that you will not have suffering. If we are people thinking of that we are want to be good so that we will have no suffering, I don't think that is possible because look at Arjuna, he has been good and he went through that suffering. Many times you also see that in the society that good people are the people who are suffering. People say that I've been always nice, I've been good, I've tried to be helping and all that. But I have to suffer. Why God has given me suffering? Whereas the other fellow who is cheat, who is immoral and all that, he is happy. So as if that suffering will not be there just because that you are good. Which basically gives an idea saying that I am being good because I don't want to suffer. Is that the idea? That means to say good has only value because that it does not give you suffering. That is the kind of an axiom on which that we are working. But then good intrinsically does not have a value. Helping somebody intrinsically does not have a value. So this is what Bhagavad Gita shows us clearly that good has an intrinsic value. That means I am good because being good itself is nice. It's not the question of that I avoid suffering and all that. Being good itself is nice in spite of the fact that there are sufferings and all those things that I want to be good because from deep inside I am good. Nature, by nature that we are good. In fact, that's what is the basic principle of the creation itself. There, in the nature that there is nothing like bad, in the nature there is good. Bad comes outside. That's why, you know, a very simple idea that Vivekananda also said, Sarve Amritasya Putra. We are all the sons of divinity. There is divinity within us. And that's what we are. And that's what is the basic idea. So being good is intrinsically good. It's not the question of that it has come business. Therefore, that be good. So therefore, that you cannot blame being good for something suffering that you are doing. So that means a higher level of interest, higher level of thinking that has to go on. <coughs> That's what Bhagavad Gita's message is. Therefore, where all the other altruistic information, all the knowledge that stops, then the whole spiritual journey starts. Spiritual journey is beyond the level of good and bad, right and wrong. Krishna did not use the emotional stir of the Arjuna to fight the war. He used the wisdom, a deeper knowledge and the higher purpose of idea that he has given in the case of Bhagavad Gita. This is the beauty of Bhagavad Gita. 700 shlokas, often people think that how could they stand in the battlefield and discuss so much when all the other army is waiting for that? Very simple answer for that. These are the local logistic answers. The simple thing is that probably the conversation must have gone about 10-15 minutes in which that basic ideas are given. But by the time that they were written into the form of book, it has come to 700 shlokas. Second thing is, in order to give a message of good and bad, right and wrong, you don't have Krishna to come here. Even the traffic police tell what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. So a very simple, anybody can tell about what is right and what is wrong. When naturally, we also know about it. Only thing is that there is something like a higher knowledge. That's why Krishna has to come. Krishna has given the message. So what is this higher knowledge? How do we go about it? We'll try to understand that a little bit in, in course of time. But essentially what must have happened is a conversation which has taken about 10-15 minutes. You can always imagine that when they are standing together and discussing about that, there must be something which is about 10-15 minutes, an easy time. And afterwards the war starts. Because basically that those days the rules were that you, you give the signal for the war and the war starts before that. Even though army is waiting there, everybody is there, that they don't take war. And that's exactly what you see in the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says to Arjuna, Arjuna says to Krishna, Hey Krishna, take the chariot in between the both arrays army, army and let me, let me look at the army and plan the war strategy. And that's a very fair question that Arjuna asked Krishna. Then... Arjuna also, when asked that, Krishna takes the chariot in between the army, places there and tells Arjuna, 
look at the army. Because often this question comes up, why this Bhagavad Gita was discussed in the battlefield of all the other places? This is supposed to be philosophy discussed in the forest. Aranyaka, as traditionally spoken. But it is discussed in the battlefield. And also it is Brahma Vidya. That's why we say, Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Su Upanishadsu Brahma Vidya Yoga Shastri. Why is it discussed in the battlefield? And Pandavas were there in the forest for 14 long years, 12 long years, and then Krishna used to visit them. He could have discussed why only Arjuna, but the whole of Pandavas would have been benefited. But why did he choose the battlefield? The simple reason is that Upanishad knowledge is where the question is asked, then only the answer comes. It's in the form of a dialogue. When Arjuna did not ask the question, Krishna did not answer. Whereas in the battlefield, Arjuna asked the question, therefore Krishna had to give an answer. Now in the battlefield, what is that Arjuna asked? You can see in the first chapter itself, Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says to Krishna, take the chariot in between the ar arrays of army. Let me plan the war strategy. So the chief of the army, that's a very fair question that he asked Krishna. Krishna exactly executes the same thing, takes the chariot in between the army and then says that look at the army. This is where the whole problem started. Arjuna did not look at the army. What Arjuna looked at is on one side his own people, on the other side his own grandfather, his own cousins, etc. etc. On both the sides you see that they are his own people, his own people. And that's what really put him into trouble. Because if I fight the war, if I kill the people, I'm killing my own people. And that's what expresses to Arjuna Krishna saying that, hey Krishna, is it fair on my part? Is it fair on my part to fight the war? Because I'm the chief person standing here to fight the war. Is it fair on my part? Because I'm going to kill my own people on both the sides. So my own people I kill, that I'll be loser. So in any case in the battle, that I'll be the loser. Why should I fight the war? Let me run away from the here to battle, from the battlefield. Krishna is listening to it. He is not answering. Arjuna goes one step ahead, saying that, hey Krishna, I'm not telling you something which is just a imagination, but look at the way these people who have come here assembled to fight the war, they're ready to give their life. So as a result of it, what happens is that back in the kingdom, all the women, widowed women, and then people who are physically, mentally challenged, such men will be there. With that men and the women, there will be whole chaos that will be there in the create in the in the whole society. Varanda Sankaraha. So therefore, that is a beautiful socialistic problem that Arjuna raises. And he exactly says this thing. Should I fight the war when I'm trying to create that kind of a society? If a person who is standing there happens to be either Confucius or Karl Marx or somebody who are renowned socialistic philosophers, they would have at once agreed, yes, Arjuna, that's very right, that we should not create the societal issues. to stop it. But then unfortunately, the fellow standing there is Krishna. And Krishna listens to the whole thing, smiles and says that, did not say anything. He could have easily said to Krishna, Arjuna, saying that, Arjuna, okay, fight the war. I will explain to you later on when we go to the tent. But then that is, now Krishna, Arjuna goes to the next level saying that, hey Krishna, it's not just my mental imagination. Look at the way that my body, my hands are shaking, my legs are shaking. I cannot stand in the chariot, eyes are blurred. I am confused. So all these physical symptoms, he says that there is no way Krishna could say to Arjuna, fight the war, I will solve the problem later. Because minimum physical fitness to fight the war, Krishna, Arjuna does not have. There is no way Krishna could say to him, okay, fight the war now, I will solve you the problem later. Because basically this is something which has to be addressed right now. In fact, all the symptoms of Krishna, Arjuna, you write down on a piece of paper and show it to any medical doctor. He will say that whoever may be the patient, but he is suffering from anxiety neurosis. That means to say it is a deep-rooted mental disturbances percolated into physiology. Therefore, that you have to remedy that. So for that remedy, basically has to be pulled out of that mental disturbances. And that's what basically happens at the 700 shlokas. At the end of it, Arjuna says to Krishna, my hands are steady, legs are steady. Tell me what should I do? And Krishna says, do whatever you feel like doing it. That means to say 
for a person who is physically not fit but krishna rises his consciousness to a level where not only he physically becomes fit but mentally he is fit to take it decision to fight the war if this has to happen that means to say this whole science of yoga krishna gives is something which elevates you to a higher level at all these personality level at the body prana mind intellect so that you become a better human being and that's what sri arbindo says that it's a journey from animal man to normal man to superman to god man level this particular journey that's what is bhagavad gita idea it's an extraordinary wonderful thing it's a science which is advanced psychology not beyond the it's not about the pace of opposite beyond the pace of opposite when the bad troubles go to good when the good itself is troubled then go to god this is a very famous quotation and it's exactly what indicates that going to god is nothing but going to this philosophy arjuna is good genuine and compassionate surrounded by very good people all the pandavas were there very good his brothers everybody is in the right direction but duryodhana was on the other hand has very bad deceptive evil to the core and surrounded by the evil people and look at these two people on either side whereas <coughs> duryodhana with all those things he did not have any problem but arjuna he was a good and genuine compassionate actually you see that his compassion itself is the one which really plays there he says my own teacher my own grandfather whose lap i grew up and then i have to kill him so it is that which is really giving him trouble so therefore basically that it is between not the discussion between good and bad but the good discussion where it is good and bad and about that level that we need to transcend that's what is the whole of bhagavad gita that's why i said that pairs of opposite that is there is a normal psychology which says that yes you are wrong he is right or he is wrong you are right therefore that you should not suffer or therefore you, what you do is supposed to be all right so these are the things which is the normal psychology talks about it whereas bhagavad gita is a state a level where it is beyond all these pairs of opposite and that's what you can see throughout the journey in bhagavad gita this an indication of about pairs of opposite so let me say a few things which will give idea about that in fact there are so many things that are there in 700 shlokas i cannot get to all those details but in this giving a glimpse of it i would like to give how beautifully that you can go to this understanding about the pairs of opposite beyond that we can go one thing is that krishna gives about karma that means action activity war is an activity war is a fighting it's a, of all the activities most treacherous activity most involving activity and that's what is war and he is a kshatriya and he is supposed to be a warrior so therefore the karma that he is doing if that can be addressed then probably every other activity can be addressed krishna gives us a very beautiful idea in this one of the discussion that he has given in this is that says that karma is fine a karma is fine but he says don't do the karma karmano hi api bodhavyam bodhavyam cha vikarmanah akarmanascha bodhavyam gahana karmano gati now a lot of translations and lot of different ways that it is given but let me give a very simple trying to understand karma is understood as action activity of course activity is what the way that from morning to night that we are doing everybody is involved in that a karma is not doing any activity not doing an activity is a karma a karma is also okay that you are resting you are peaceful you are fighting some people are more a karma some people are more karma some people are more tendency to do activity some people are more tendency to lazy sit down quiet so both these things are there different uh, kind of people krishna says karma is also fine a karma is also fine action is also fine and non action is also fine but he says the real problem is vikarma now when he says about vikarma then immediately the question comes up what is that krishna is meaning by vikarma many translations when i went through that they try to give vikarma is nishidha karma that means to say a prohibited activities like for example don't tell lie don't 
injure somebody, don't rape some girl, don't do any harm to anybody. This is what is Vikarma, like that many translations have given. I was not happy with those translations because basically that it is Krishna is addressing Arjuna and Arjuna has never done that kind of a thing in his lifetime. He has never cheated anybody, he has never injured anybody, he has never said any lie to anybody. He was very honest, very sincere. So there is no way Krishna could tell Arjuna that don't do all these things because if Krishna says that, Arjuna would have replied to Krishna saying that, why do you tell me all those things? I have not done at all. I don't do at all. I don't have any intention of that. Why are you wasting your time and my time? So Vikarma does not mean that kind of negative activity, prohibited kind of activity. Then but what is that Vikarma? Krishna says very strongly that don't do Vikarma. This is what we need to understand much deeply. I was thinking for a while and then I came up with an idea. But then it also something that it applied 5000 years ago when Krishna said in battlefield of Bhagavad Gita. But it should also apply today. Therefore, this Bhagavad Gita becomes like an eternal text. Or for the future generation, the karma should, have, should, should be something which is always there. So when I started thinking about this, I came for a very simple hypothetical example. I tried to translate that with saying that. Like doing an activity, karma, not doing an activity is akarma, which is a part of our life. We choose to do activity, we choose not to do activity. Like I'm just a simple crude example of the day-to-day -day life. For a common man, that I'm watching something which is very important on the TV program, some cricket match, or some football match, something like that. I'm engrossed in that, you know, particularly when you're engrossed in that kind of a match. You can't even sit down and watch. You have to stand up and, you know, get up fully dressed. At that time, my little son comes and says that, Papa, can you help me with this math? I said, no way. Because at this point of time, when I'm enjoying this, when I'm fully engrossed, even if I my attention is drifted for a second and something disaster might happen, some wicket might fall down, some goal might happen. I said, no, don't disturb me. I'm busy. Go and ask your mom. And then he goes to mom and says that, mom, can you help me? He says, I'm busy cooking. Go and ask papa to do it. No, papa says he's busy. I know what is busy. He's watching the game. That's all. Go and ask him. See, now he comes back to you. And now he says, Papa, can you please help me urgently because I need to finish this. Now you have a choice between either do the activity or don't do the activity. Either help him or don't help him. These are the two things, karma and akarma. And she was the second one saying that, no, I don't want to help you. Meanwhile, from kitchen also, the sound comes saying that, come on, go ahead, help him. Don't dodge him. Now, when this boss says like that, you can't do anything. So therefore, now you shift your position from karma to akarma, akarma to karma, saying that, okay, tell me what it is quickly. Don't waste your time in my time. Again, the instruction comes from the kitchen. Help him nicely. Don't shout at him. You have no other go, but you stomach the whole thing. But outside with a smile, you say, okay, my dear child, tell me what to do, how to do that. You see what's happening. You are doing an activity, but at the same time, you are suppressing the inner feeling of, I don't want to do the activity. There is so much of force of akarma is there within us, and that I am suppressing and doing an activity. This is what is vikarma. Vikarma is that doing an activity, but at the same time that I am fighting with that activity which I am doing. And who is fighting with that? Within me, these two personalities, one is that you do the activity, other personality is that don't do the activity. And there is a clash between these two personalities who are me. That means to say, I only split into two and then I'm fighting with myself. And this is what is the karma. This is simple thing. You say, either you do the activity or don't do activity, fine. But Krishna says, don't do vikarma. Why? Because vikarma is the one where you are creating a violence within you. You cannot see the violence outside, but that violence is there within you. And who created this violence? You created this violence. And this applies in the battlefield when Krishna says to Arjuna, 
don't do vikarma that means to say you want to run away to the battlefield run away from the battlefield to the forest you could as well do that peacefully quietly and go and sit down and meditate that's what is the part of this particular culture itself that there are so many people gone to the forest sat down meditation but then they are peaceful they are not fighting with anything whereas you by nature that you are a warrior and then you go to the forest and sit down and try to meditate you cannot be meditating because the inner force is there what's happening in the battlefield and what to do so every day that you will get the newspaper in the forest and see that what's happening in kurukshetra that means to say a big part of your mind is involved in fighting the war and a part of mind is saying that no let me not involve in that so you create a vikarma within you now you are in the battlefield you say that it's my own people that how can i kill them i'll be peaceful even if i ask you to sit fight war you will always be having vikarma within you in your karma there is vikarma in your vikarma there is in your akarma there is vikarma that means activity there is vikarma non activity there is vikarma you are always with this vikarma that you drop it i don't mind with that you are going to the forest and meditating but if you do not have the vikarma that is fine but that is not going to happen with you this is what is arjuna's condition when krishna said don't do vikarma and look at the way today how many activities that we are doing are we doing an activity look into yourself very clearly deeply seeing that are you not fighting with yourself you want to get up early in the morning and you set up the alarm and alarm rings and then first thing that thought that crosses the mind is oh my god it's already 6 o'clock i just hit this morning 6 o'clock and you hit the alarm <coughs> that means to say there is a vikarma that's going on and you want to go to the office you go to the highway and then you see the traffic jam and i see how many people they bang on the steering bang on the car bang on this bang on that che horrible traffic who asked you to get into the traffic you only got into the traffic by saying all those things traffic is not going to reduce your car is not going to fly above the sky above the traffic but then you are going to be there so that means to say as long as that you are there you are in the vikarma when you look at this way that 24 hours of the day just look at you are you doing karma are you doing akarma or are you doing vikarma you see that it is 90% of the time we are doing vikarma only 10% of the time either we are doing an activity or we are resting and that's one of the reasons why today the work has become such a big burden on us when work has become a burden on us we say that all right and then give up the work you can you sit quiet we can't do that sitting quiet that means akarma also became such a big burden you can't keep quiet even for few seconds minutes you become restless you want to do some activity or the other look at the people when the weekend comes how restless do they become that means to say are you can just sit quiet you don't do anything but then sitting quiet is more painful than doing an activity therefore that you have to do some activity or the other so both the says karma is also becoming problem a karma is also becoming problem because while doing a karma that you are contemplating on doing karma while doing activity non activity that you are contemplating on doing an activity that means to say there is a constant vikarma that's going on krishna says give it up how can we give it up the simple suggestion for that is that karma you are doing or a karma is vastu stiti that means to say it is the situation outside demands you please understand that it's because the situation that you have to do it like for example in the traffic you need to go yes the traffic will be there you can just imagine any city today is with the traffic and then you go with the traffic accept the traffic 100% totally be with that and then drive then you see that the vikarma drops off so when vastu stiti that means the situation outside whatever demands you just accept it i go to the airport waiting for the flight to take off now any moment the announcement come to see that the flight is loaded but then at that time announcement come because of some technical issues the flight is delayed by 2 hours now 2 hours you are just keep quiet in the airport can you keep quiet totally 100% not fighting within yourself 
This is what is a karma. Accept a karma. Accept karma. Then there is no vikarma within you. This is what is a solution. And that's a solution all the time. Rising above the level of vikarma is rising above the level of karma and akarma. This is what is pairs of opposite and go beyond that. Recognize what's happening beyond that and then take care of that. That's what is the idea. Who created vikarma, if you think of it? How did you create that kind of restlessness within you? Nobody else can create vikarma for you. It's not because of anybody. You might say, the airlines is bad, this is bad, traffic is horrible, roads are bad. All those things are fine. But then vikarma is not connected with all those things. It is free from that. Nobody can create vikarma for you. You only create. You wanted to be in the traffic, therefore that you are stuck there. It's vikarma is your own creation. I always give an example that, you know, when I was working as an engineer, all colleagues we used to get together and then have breakfast, have lunch together, open the lunch boxes, and then chit chat and then exchange even the lunch that is there. I had a colleague of mine, Mullah Nasruddin, he was sitting with us along with his lunch box. Open the lunch box, he would see the lunch box and see. And say, same dal, same roti, same sabji. One day he said, maybe he did not like it. Second day he said, third day he said. I listened to it three, four days and said, my dear, Bula, what is this? If you want a different breakfast, lunch, ask your wife to pack some different things. That's what we all do. It. Ask your wife what we He said, you are lucky. What do you mean by you are lucky? Your wife will not listen to you. No. Then what is the issue? He said, I'm not married. You are not married, then who packs your lunch box? Mulla said, I pack my lunch box. You pack your lunch box and complain about that. When Mullah does that, we all laugh. But what is your life if you look at it? Is it not your own packed lunch box? You decided to what you are doing it. Is it not your decision that you are doing it? Based on all the given circumstances, you chose to do what you are doing it. Go ahead with the life with a hundred percent involvement in that. This is what is going about that. All these pairs of opposite that are there, good and bad, right and wrong, I like and don't like it, work or no work, all these things arise above that level. That's what is basically the way that we karma. Beyond that, peaceful state. Then the activity becomes like a celebration. Every moment should be a celebration. You celebrate a, you celebrate a peaceful road, you celebrate a traffic road, you celebrate a traffic jam, and you celebrate waiting at the airport. When you can celebrate, life becomes one of celebration. Second thing is, of course, there are several ideas that are there, but let me take up another idea. The soul creation understood by dividing into the various categories. It's a unique way that Indian philosophy, particularly Sankhya, has given this. The soul creation is made out of three gunas, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. A, beautiful, a simple example to understand about this, illustrate that is, take a plant, when you take a plant, the roots are there in the soil, dirt, slush, everything. And then the stem comes up into the stem. And then hard, strong, holding the tree together. And then the third is the flowers in the foliage and the sky. This is what is divided into three different aspects. One is called the roots are supposed to be tamas. The stem is supposed to be the rajas and then the flowers in the foliage is sattva. Flowers in the foliage and all those things in the free sky, different colors and aroma and all that that is there. That's what represents sattva and the hard, strong, supplying the material, etc, etc, holding the plant tight. The stem is supposed to be rajas and the roots are supposed to be tamas. So all these three things together are the plant. Now, there is nothing like one is good and the other is bad. They're all doing their work. All the work connected with that is what is that? Like, for example, the roots do the work of eating only on the slush. So that's supposed to be tamasic. Never sees the day of light. It's always underground in darkness. The darkness is supposed to be tamas. Whereas the stem which is holding tight and protecting the tree is supposed to be rajas. Similarly, the flowers and the foliage is sattva. If you take a look at the human being, his feet are always there on the ground, carrying the weight of the body. And the middle portion of the body is the 
portion where all the activity is going on and the distribution digestion and then circulation of blood everything is going on rajas and then the head where the thinking planning scheming is going on is sattva so all these three things are necessary in a human being legs are doing their work head is doing its work nothing is good nothing is bad unfortunately a lot of people have given the hierarchical idea saying that sattva is very good rajas is bad but then tamas is horrible there is nothing like that sankhya philosophy never said that's what krishna says in bhagavad gita also that gita says that all these three things are part of this human being part of the plant and the plant's health is like that then all these three things are there the moment that you separate the tree, roots from the tree <coughs> the tree will die or you might say that no 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 sattva is something which is very important being in the sky in the free air is something which is very important so let me expose my roots of this particular plant the plant will die or sometimes even the fruits and foliage also should should be in the tamas so that i put them into tamas that will also die each giving respect to itself that's what is basically necessary and the way that indian philosophy looked at that even the society is also living vibrant like the way that human being is there like a plant is there so he also the society also requires all these three different kind of activities there are rajasic activities there are sattvic activities there are tamasic activities will all of them put together make the society and human being also has all these different activities now there are especially some human beings who are who are basically rajasic some people are basically more predominantly sattvic predominantly tamasic so if you can really identify these three different kind of people and then give the kind of work that they do matches with their nature that's what is the way basically that you can make them to feel comfortable happy don't have any complaints about the work that's why krishna says chaturvarnyam maya srishtam guna karma vibhagasha it is based on guna and karma the karma has gunas and the guna has that uh, connected with the karma put them together very simple example is that cutting the butter with a butter knife is a sattvic activity cutting the firewood with the axe is a rajasic activity cutting the steel with a gas cutter is a tamasic activity do wear what need to be paid. if a butter is given to you don't use an axe use a butter knife similarly don't cut the tree with the help of butter knife it can never be cut so this is what is put them right kind of thing to right way that's how the whole creation is done the society survived for 10000 20000 years because that we knew how to put match these things and we match them so beautifully a kshatriya is somebody is supposed to be somebody who has that protection distribution and all those things is by vaishya so those people who have that special ability to do that yes they were doing it where well, brahman is supposed to be thinker analyzer etc etc he can't do any other thing he can do that so give him that kind of a job that he would enjoy that there will not be any conflict in him unfortunately today what happened is that guna and karma they are not our preferences a preferences have been something else it's like money monetary attraction or the powers of the position these are the things have become very important than the nature of a person if you go by the nature then we will not create a conflict within that rise above these three different qualities sattva rajas tamas look at them from a devil from a equivalent angle economic angle then you see that what need to be put what way this is what is basically the way trying to understand create the remove the conflict rise above the three levels of that's why krishna says trigunya vishayaha vedaha recognize that all these three gunas are there in the nature vistray gunyo bhavarjuna go beyond these three gunas and that's what is very important there are several examples which can show that how people belong to a particular category and they are happy with that particular category of work that's fine as long as that that is why not whereas today what happened is that unfortunately there is so much of a rat race for the money for the riches for this all those things that happen because of which that people do not care for their own nature as a result of it the fight goes on 
A simple example that I can give you is that a highly intellectual person, an analytical person is a person normally that he performs in the exam very well. He goes to an institution called as IITs. Whereas an ordinary person who doesn't have all that, but then he's sportsman, this, that, all that kind of thing. And he goes to an ordinary engineering college. Finally, both of them come out and then they go to a foreign company where both of them are absorbed. There, the person who is having Rajasik tendency in him, and he is an average engineering student, but then in two, three, five years that he recognizes the, he realizes the trick of the trade, and he starts a company where he really makes millions of dollars, basically, because that he has an ability to become a CEO and develop that. Whereas a person who is highly talented who go to IIT says that I graduated from a superior engineering college. Why not I start up a startup and make more money than him? See, money has become criteria. He starts a startup, but he is not Rajasik, the quality necessary for running a company. He doesn't have that. As a result of it, what happens? He suffers. So this is what basically today what happened is in the society that we have not created, understood the nature inside and what is the nature of the work that is there outside. We are not putting them together. Your nature and your activity is something which is matching. This is what our scripture said. What a beautiful way that we said that Kshatriya is a person who is a warrior and he organizes a team. He is a CEO like today. And Arjuna was a Kshatriya. Arjuna is fighting the war. He cannot go to meditate like the way Brahmin does. That's why Krishna says that don't get confused with that. Go beyond all that. What is meant by going beyond all that? Kshatriya, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, they are there in the creation, in the body-mind complex. Here it is there. But you are the consciousness. Go beyond that. The consciousness is free from all those things. Once you go to that state of consciousness, then it is easy for you to understand these things and put them in the right way. And that's what is the method of going transcending beyond the three different levels. Mr. Egunyo Bhavarjuna. So that is what Krishna says to Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. Similarly, there's one thing called as changing the world uh, and three gunas and changing world and unchanging self. World is continuously changing and behind that the unchanging self is there. Normally what happens is that for us, we look at the world and the world changes that happen, really tosses and uh, brings about all that kind of difficulties with us. Whereas, look at the way that what Krishna changed, says in Bhagavad Gita, the very apt kind of thing is that whenever there is a change, recognize that behind this change, there is something which is an unchanging principle behind it. Like on a white board, when I write with a colored pen, the letters, I can see the letters because that there is a white board behind it. Without that white board, I can't see these letters. So that means to say there is a background something, and the foreground, something which is changing, that I write the letters, I can rub it off and then write new letters. All these things can be possible because of the background. Similarly, I'm sitting in the train and suddenly I realize that the train is moving. Oh, train is moving. Somebody said, no, don't look at the train. The train is not moving because that you are looking at the other train which is moving. Look at the platform side, your train is standing. So that means to say, against the background, that there is something which is basically either moving or non-moving experiences there. So therefore, that within you also, that there is a non-moving reality in front, behind this moving reality that's happening. And moving reality has a birth and death, all those things part of it. You go beyond that non-moving reality. That's what is the consciousness. <coughs> Whatever that is born will die. Whatever that is death will be born again. But you be free from these things and then perform your duty. That's what is the way that rise above the level of changing to the unchanging self. World belongs to the changing. Everything is changing in this world. But the self is something which is unchanging. The whole pursuit of going to this particular self which is unchanging is the spiritual journey, is a journey that yoga is meant for, Bhagavad Gita is trying to give us. Like this, that there is one thing called as known, there is unknown, 
and there's something which is unknowable. We all have that idea of there is something which is known. Yes, our journey is always going from unknown to known. This is what we know. Every child is born, does not know anything. And the journey in this life is process of knowing. And unknowing, unknown, and not having knowledge is nothing negative. Not having knowledge is the, is the base, data, and the knowledge happens after that. Every child starts with the non-knowledge. In fact, what happens is that not having knowledge in the child is something which is so blissful in the child that you enjoy the child. We also join starter level, and then we start knowing, and that's what is the journey that we go for. And this, as long as that we have this instrument of intellect mind complex that is there, knowing process goes on. Every moment, the knowing process is going on. So this journey is something which is going on. But the most important thing, aspect of it is that the more and more that we know, the true knowledge is that, that it will give us an understanding that there is so much which is unknown about it, unknowable about it. So this bit makes us humble. Knowledge can make us humble. And that kind of a knowledge which makes us humble is the right kind of knowledge. Often what happens is that arrogance of the knowledge is something which is creating us a problem. Psychological problems are because of the arrogance of knowledge, not because of knowledge, nor because of ignorance. That's why a beautiful a philosopher like Radhakrishna said very beautifully, said that a knowledge which does not become a wisdom, it becomes like an arrogance. It's like the way a donkey carrying the sandalwood Donkey only knows the weight of the sandalwood, but not the worth of the sandalwood. And knowledge only becomes worthwhile if it becomes like a wisdom. That means to say, a wisdom is that where between the non-knowing, knowing, and beyond that. And that's what is acceptance of something which is extraordinary, a noble concept of it. This way, when we make a journey, and that journey is something which is going beyond the pairs of opposite, beyond the good and bad, beyond the right and wrong, beyond the ignorance and knowledge, we go beyond that. So this is what is the whole message of Bhagavad Gita, which is talking about transcending at the different level. Another very important aspect that Krishna brings about, that one small little point that I would like to talk about. And uh, after that, we'll make it very clear, that is, in Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna says that we have a responsibility to Arjuna, we have the responsibility to fight the war, and you don't have to have the focus on the resultant of an action. And the idea is there is no right for the root of fruit of action. You have no right for the fruit of action. This word is not there. Basically, good work, good work has the fruit. And that fruit belongs to the work itself. Making the whole discussion short, I would tell, I'd like to give you an idea that this word called right is not there in Sanskrit at all. The word there Krishna uses is the adhikara. Adhikara is not power. Adhikara is not even right. Adhikara is a responsibility. Because many other places that Adhikara has been used as responsibility are the eligibility. It's not the question of right at all. In fact, in our scripture itself, in our whole scripture, we don't have any word called right. The king has no right. Citizen has no right. No power, no power has any right or anything. In it. The powers only will have responsibility. Why this is so important to understand is the idea that Rights divide us, responsibilities unite us. In the nature, there are only the responsibility. There is no right at all. Look at the nature, how nature has this responsibility. When the bird wants to lay the eggs, the bird collects twigs and then create a nice, wonderful, cozy nest. And the mother bird makes the cozy nest and then lays the eggs in that nest and then takes the responsibility to sit on the eggs to hatch, give the warmth to hatch the eggs, 
it's all bird taking responsibility even when the little chicks come out of this eggs the mother bird goes around collects the twigs and feeds the child first before like uh, collects the worm and feeds the child before eating herself so that means to say the mother bird has that responsibility it's not like in the aircraft where it says that put on your belt first and then put the child's belt later it's not that way first you feed the child then you eat and it's not only the birds that you can see that in the nature itself it is like that and afterwards when the child little birds grow big enough the mother bird realizes that they have the uh, capacity to fly and all those things then the mother birds actually removes the twigs and then push the little one out and the little one now jumps out of the nest and start fluttering the wings and flies the mother is happy see until that time the mother takes the responsibility look at the nature everywhere there is responsibility you cut the tree on one side the roots take the responsibility to spread other side to see that the tree is stable the nature works on responsibility not on rights rights divide us so the more and more that psychologically that we think of accepting responsibility rather than right the world can be more harmonious made uniform and then we can create a better world let us try to look for that way wherever it is possible wherever we can educate bring people together let's bring it in the form of responsibility not in the form of rights so that way when you do it you can create a better world and i've seen that in the cultures where the people take the responsibility and they don't do it i was in japan in a shinto temple giving a yoga seminar and when we went to that seminar i saw that temple there was nobody else that was there it was open for us spick and span absolutely clean and then our people went and then opened the doors and this and that you know there it's all you have to arrange and then get all the desks sat down whole day seminar we did we had food and everything else. at the end of it every participant in that seminar tried to do the works themselves put the doors together put the walls together and all those things clean mop everything in such a way that spick and span again by the time we came out i saw that everybody joined hand the work becomes like a pleasure the world is a place of pleasure world is a heaven if you can take the world with the help of responsibility not on the right this is what is the way indian psychology says that you are responsible this world to be made as heaven earthly hell that's why it is very beautifully said in a chinese proverb heaven and hell they are not altitudes but their attitude a right kind of attitude is where we all work with responsibility not looking for rights let's create a beautiful world with this i call it with this idea like this there are several several such hints that are there in bhagavad gita which can give us extraordinary wonderful wisdom and extraordinary wonderful direction with these few words let me take leave of you thank you so much many thanks uh, again uh, respected raghuram ji it was wonderful to listen to you and as usual you have been so insightful and uh, uh, very unique in your uh, narration of uh, the session on bhagavad gita as well thank you so much for uh, being a part of this uh, series swatantra bharat 75 we look forward to having more and more association and guidance from you in the future thank you so much thank you dhanyawad dhanyawad